This is BOTDF. We're here with an interview. What's we up? We are both the dance floor. Garrett Ecstasy, Dobby Vanity, and we are both the dance floor. And how long have you been playing? Two years. Two, two years. years. Working on two years. Dobby was um together for about you know a year, half year working on that, and then I frequently joined. Um, my sister actually started dating Dobby, and I met Dobby in Orlando at a Jeffree Star concert. We love our fans. Don't forget, we're the fans band. And this is our goal, this is our purpose, is to make you guys happy. We hope you so, guys have a lot of fun tonight, you know? I mean, like this, I mean, though. And our show's about partying. I mean, you see a lot of YouTube videos of, of people like hating and stuff like that. But I'll tell you, it's a lot of love. We're all about the love movement. And we're all about spreading a positive message. You know, positivity is our philosophy. That's a what's of, up. A lot of parents think, you know, like we have a lot of problems with parents telling their kids, oh, you're not going to blow the dance floor show, or like venues telling us we're not we're not allowed to curse or everything. We're like, yeah. you know, that's our act. I mean, we you know, promote. a bunch of people see it as like, Sending oh my God, that's so bad and negative. But really, we're being positive. We're taking away from the, you know, we're taking away from the politics problems. You, we're taking you away gotta look at the every day. Having fun, you know what I mean? You know, we're here to make people feel good about each other. You know, yeah, we wear crazy hair, yeah, our outfits are ridiculous, but this is what makes us happy, you know what I mean? This is pure bliss, and if people don't get that, whatever, do what makes you happy, you know what I mean? Like, if people are gonna hate you, that's ridiculous, ridiculous, you should be yourself and be the best at it, you know? That's my, I'm just spreading love, that's it. right now give it to them give me all your applause I want them all give me your applause right now I want the applause you see this thing give them to me right the f now don't be a prude don't be a prude give me that hello kitty give me that hello kitty I want it Street. Okay. Crap. Anymore. If you ain't got something nice to say about my daughter, then keep your mouth shut and any more of your comments to put on there, I'm recording them all and they are being sent to the police they department. Have been and guess what? Out. You were emails will be caught and will be bound. And who said you're gonna beat my daughter up? You will have to deal with the police because you done goofed. <laughs> Throughout 2020, many YouTube commentary channels, along with Chris Hansen, took it upon themselves to start speaking about Darvi Vanity, many of which platformed and interviewed multiple survivors who each had their own story, their own experience, with the now irrelevant crunkcore slash scene idol. If you don't know who Darvi Vanity is, if you don't know what crunkcore or scene is, or Blood on the Dance Floor, Kawaii Monster, or any of the personalities associated with Darvi, real name Jesus David Torres, don't worry, we will go through all that shortly. I would firstly like to say that I feel that those creators, Repzilla, Tay Mimi, Edwin's Generation, Pastel Bell, who now goes by Bell Aubrey, and even Chris Hansen did fantastic jobs helping bring to light what is now thought to be well over a decade of a former MySpace e-celeb using his power dynamic as a quote-unquote rock star to bully, control, harass, and much worse, what is speculated to be over 30 women, of which at least 16 of them were underage at the time of these events. It has been suggested that Darby has been taking advantage of and ruining lives since 2004. Unfortunately, I don't have anything to even speculate that, so this video will concentrate on the start and subsequent rise of Darby Vanity and Blood on the Dance Floor. 
So again, before I dive into Darby's career, the lifestyle, the culture, and more, I want to ask you, the audience, a question. A question that I will try to answer at the end of this video, and it's a question I want you to keep in mind as we work our way through this. It is now 2021. Darby is living in Florida with his parents. He only possesses his Instagram account where he's trying to sell merch to what remains of his fan base, promoting his merch website Dark Arts. He retains none of his power dynamic. He can no longer mobilize his fan base against preteen girls. He can no longer silence allegations or even criticism. He has too many allegations which do line up with dates and times as per some of the source material I'll show later. He is a shadow of his former self. So my question is this. Why did people stop talking about him? And don't get it twisted, this isn't a dig, it's not a critique. As I said earlier, the creators who told this story and allowed the survivors to tell their stories on their platforms did fantastic jobs of doing so. Darvi is, in many people's opinions, far worse than Onision, and yet Onision content never really stopped. There was even a documentary made about him. But as I said, keep that question in your mind as we walk through Darvi's history. Oh, and one last thing. I'm no fan of trigger warnings, but yeah, unironic trigger warning, especially those who are survivors of S.A. Since Darby first made his way onto the MySpace and general mid to late noughties internet scene, he presented himself as this super positive, say no to the man rockstar type personality. His first persona was that of Darby Vanity, the elite hair god. He gained a name for himself as this guy who was super nice, very charismatic, a little bit hyperactive in his demeanor, softly spoken, and this young hip man with an eye for fashion and makeup. From the screenshots I've been throwing up of Darby, these should give you an idea of what would become the visual identity of what would later be referred to as quote-unquote the scene. You may have heard of the term scene kid or even crunkcore as a music genre. To understand Darby, to realize how he did what he did, we need to understand firstly his initial MO and what scene would become. Darby Vanity, as I previously stated, initially gained somewhat of a following on MySpace during 2006 and 2007 as a Orlando-based hair stylist. It was during this period that Darby used his platform, again his position as someone people followed, to allegedly groom a 14-year-old Diana Farrell. They had spoken for several weeks, with Darby ending conversations by telling her that he loved her. He visited her home with the promise of styling her hair. Now, it is worth noting here that Diana's mother was a single parent working two nursing jobs. You'll notice this is somewhat of a trend with the survivors of Darby. Broken homes or examples of poverty and poor parenting. That seems to be his favored MO. Diana had decided to call into a Christian radio show to talk about what had happened when Darby visited. The host, Dawson McAllister, had determined that what had happened was indeed a crime. Diana pleaded with Dawson, asking him to not tell her mother. McAllister did take it to the police, however. The charge, the felony of lewd and lascivious battery, was brought against Darby, but the investigation halted almost immediately as Diana's mother promised to not press charges against Darby if he cut off all communication with her, which he did do. And throughout Darby's career, you will see a lot of this for several different reasons. Now, it was during 2006 that Darby decided to start his own band named Love the Fashion with fellow bandmate Christopher Mongillo and Rebecca Fugotti. The group didn't really take anything seriously until a year later in July 2007 when Love the Fashion was converted into Blood on the Dance Floor. Now, Darby would go through quite a few band members over the years. In 2008, Darby had removed Chris, Rebecca, and someone called Matty M from the group and had brought in Garrett McLaughlin, also known as Garrett Ecstasy. He had removed the previous band members due to their inability to tour, allegedly. It is important for me to stop there and talk about what would be known as the scene, crunkcore, the style, the culture, and mentality of scene kids. I won't dive too much into this, but it is important that I do drive home the gravity of this story. The scene was at its most prevalent between 2008 to 2010. It's clear that the culture, style, fashion, and music started in 2006, and Blood on the Dance Floor themselves actually reached their peak in 2012. But between those years of 08 and 2010 is really when the scene was at its height in terms of the amount of bands, the evolution of the music genre of crunkcore itself, and so on. So firstly, what is crunkcore? 
Well, I'm not playing any of it because one, copyright, and two, I've suffered enough making this video, thank you very much. But to articulate it for you, it was a mixture of dance, metal, party, punk, with screaming and auto-tune. The lyrics of the songs were about partying, getting drunk, being as edgy and offensive as possible, and the act of being seen itself. Being seen meant dressing as brightly and as obnoxiously as possible, with big frilly hair, makeup, basically the guy on screen I'm showing right now. I don't really give my opinion in these videos as retrospectives are supposed to be me telling a story and you guys deciding for yourselves, but if it wasn't clear by my tone, I despise the entire era, all of it, it was awful. The music, the fashion, the lyrics, I'm so very glad I was serving in the Navy at the time and didn't have to subject myself to this garbage until now. I mean, these kids thought they were fighting against the man and spreading a message. Go read the lyrics, guys. Eminem, Rage Against the Machine, Metallica, even the new metal bands of the early noughties had far better messages to spread. But tangents aside, this genre mostly attracted preteen girls, very edgy preteen girls, many of which, if you look up their Tumblr poetry, clearly had severe mental health problems. Hashtag not all. The genre itself attracted very lonely, young ladies who came from terrible broken backgrounds and they likely saw groups like blood on the dance floor in their community which would be later named sgtc slash gash terror crew and with darby being this softly spoken positivity be yourself you are enough perpetuating guy who claimed to not care about criticism and being as carefree as possible this would have attracted these young ladies in particular Darby would make these kind of statements in interviews and even use the acronym PLUR, P-L-U-R, Peace, Love, Unity, Respect, as a tagline. This was used by him and his rabid fan base to silence criticism of him because you shouldn't be negative, man. The scene was effectively about being yourself, having no fear of being cheesy or cringy, being loving, a fact he would later exploit, being rebellious and just being a part of something bigger than yourself. Several of the survivors, including Damien Leonhard, formerly known as Jesse Slaughter, have stated that it was very normal for seeing kids back then to be very touchy-feely with each other, and a lot of them were very promiscuous. The scene usually attracted members of the LGBT or those who felt persecuted in their IRL, offering a community of like-minded people who wanted to create a loving environment for others to substitute the cruel reality many of those members lived. Despite my opinion of all of the aforementioned, I do get it. I do understand it. But I imagine most of the people who were once seen kids look back and cringe somewhat. Other bands within this genre included Jeffree Star, and yes, we will be talking about him later in this video, Dot Dot Curve, Broken Side, and The Millionaires. There were more, but most fell into irrelevancy pretty quickly, and Blood on the Dance Floor would later become the top dogs within this genre and would often be the headlining act after having spent years being the openers on the Warp Tour. Now that I've given you a brief history into what scene was, I'll place a one hour video in the description which details the genre and the rise and fall of Blood on the Dance Floor incredibly well. Let's move on to Darby's fan base themselves, their behavior, how Darby exploited their behavior and the questionable lyrics of Blood on the Dance Floor. Blood on the Dance Floor's audience in particular within the scene often defended Darby's action with cult levels of aggression. As I mentioned previously, these kids felt that Darby and those like him were their heroes. When Darby spoke in interviews, he said things that they identified with, concepts of community, love, respect, and simply being free. So for example, when the young but infamous Jesse Slaughter, who now goes by Damien and uses they them pronouns, but for this bit I'll be referring to her past self, an incredibly polarizing subject that I'm not going to dive into in this video too heavily, but if you guys would like me to cover it more in depth, please let me know. But when it came to Jesse Slaughter, as the most prominent example of Darby weaponizing his audience, using them to dogpile and bully anyone who dare bring to light his misconduct with underage girls. Although in this particular case, it wasn't Jesse who brought the allegations to the public. It was her friend and Jesse's reaction to hers and Darby's open intimate relationship when she was just 10 years old. That Darby? Well, he contributed to her doxing, posting her phone number on Twitter, telling his fans to call her and tell her exactly what they think. He and Jay producing and uploading a video parodying, Jesse crying on stream with her father making threats towards the entire internet, oh, and writing and recording a song titled You Done Goofed. 
a title echoing Jesse's father's words during that infamous livestream, which was on the Epic album. The Epic album was released in 2010, reaching number 5 on the US Billboard Top Electronic Albums chart and 12th on the US Billboard Top Heat Seekers. The song was released on her 12th birthday too. Jessie's story, however, is much more than this. It involves her being trolled by 4chan, being dogpiled by them, seeing kids online and in real life. We will revisit Jessie later in the video, although we won't go too in depth. I just wanted to give a solid example of Darby utilizing, well, children to do his dirty work and effectively destroy a little girl. It is worth me mentioning also that she wasn't taken seriously due to her behavior online and most likely because of her very severe mental health issues. This wasn't the only example of this kind of behavior from the SGTC. In many cases, those who tried to stand up to him, bring light to his actions, or taking it to social media, they would often be met with a horde of Darby zealots. You often see this kind of behavior exhibited by fandoms or communities surrounding online personalities to this day. One could describe Darby as a kind of pioneer in this field of bullying little girls into submission. Now, in 2015, Darby Vanity did upload a vlog wherein he tried to argue against the many accusations of SA against him, which inevitably started the decline of Blood on the Dance Floor, and that his music was also made for adults, despite claims that it wasn't, and also that his shows were for adults. Now, to my knowledge, Darby isn't blind or deaf, despite his music and fashion taste. If you look at these pictures taken from concerts and watch the many videos out there, you'll see that one, his shows were not age-gated, two, they are filled with very young girls. So when Darby was staring down from the stage or, you know, walking around before and after the show, shoving his tongue down every girl's throat along with groping them on stage or otherwise, you cannot tell me that he didn't notice how young his audience was. I mean, the Hello Kitty bra incident wasn't a red flag, no. Okay, well what about the music itself? Well, let's read the lyrics, shall we? As pointed out in Edwin's video, he read some of the lyrics from the song Innocent High, which I'm just going to throw up on screen for you guys to read as just one example. And here is the aforementioned bra requesting video just for context. Yes. Give me your bras right now. Give it to them. Give me all your bras. I want them all. Give me your bras right now. I want the bras. You see this thing? Give them to me right the f now. Don't be a prude. Don't be a prude. Give me that Hello Kitty. Give me that Hello Kitty. I want it. Also, given what we know now, when you read the lyrics to a song he called Candyland, which is on screen now, yeah, it's almost like he's warning everyone or something. I mean, these lyrics from the song Sexting, which was a song he collaborated with Jeffree Star on, have one particular major red flag in the lyrics. Hells yeah, go for more. Parents banging down the door. Oh no, caught with my pants down, now I gotta leave this town. And seeing as we're talking about lyrics, I mentioned Jesse Slaughter and the song You Done Goofed earlier, right? Well, have a read of the lyrics to that song. Now, one would think with Darby's message of peace, love, unity, and respect being enough, being kind and understanding, that he wouldn't or couldn't write and release a song like that. Well, I digress. Before I re-platform the survivors and their stories, I do want to touch on more of the band's history as there are a series of important events as Blood on the Dance Floor gained more and more fame and notoriety within the music industry and the internet and social media that I feel are needed for maximum context. Also, we will have to talk about Jeffree Star, won't we? Let's move on. For those who weren't around in the MySpace days, the social media platform wasn't just that. It was also a place where up-and-coming bands and musical artists could upload their music and gain new fans. They could advertise their albums, merch, and tour dates. And I'll be honest, the music posted wasn't very good. But these were brand new bands, more often than not exercising their creativity and flapping their musical chops as it were. Blood on the Dance Floor was no exception to this, this is how they initially gained their fame. As I said at the start of the video, Darby knew exactly how to utilize social media to his benefit. Whether it was advertising himself using keywords, search engine optimization, images, colorful text and just how to present himself to his desired audience so he could attain what he aspired to grab. 
Not only did Darby manage to build his following that he could later weaponize, but this allowed him to network and put himself out there. Alongside Jeffree Star at Times and other bands on the Warp Tour, Blood on the Dance Floor gained notoriety as provocative and offensive. Darby's behavior in the public eye was often nearly as outrageous as his private behavior. Here, let me show you some clips of his public face on tours. Apparently, all right, so here's what happened. I was doing an interview, and somebody went a little personal, and I took my microphone and I smacked on the head like this. I'm sorry, I've got anger issues, I can't help it. I believe in every single one of you inside this room right now. We are not a fan base. We are a cult. And if you know that we are a cult, then you know too much, and we can't tell you anymore. No, no, no. Oh my God, I have the craziest story to tell you. Girl, <laughs> girl what happened? What happened? It was crazy. This woman, she like, I just got on the bus, and I was like, like fixing myself, and like some <laughs> cop knocks on the bus. I'm like, who the. So I opened the door and it's his mom and she's like, uh, my daughter's in there and I was like, the f she is? I just got on this bus, ain't nobody in here, someone had to unlock it for me. And she was like, well, one of the security guards told me that Dobby and my 15 year old daughter just walked back to the bus. I was like, her kid comes around the corner and she's like, oh, she's right there, Dobby's right there. I was like, ah, oh, thank you. Ah, uh, throw that bitch. Where? Where's that mother? Let's beat her. Let's beat her. Let's beat her. Let's As you can see, Darby had no issue acting as inappropriately as possible, even when just simply talking to fans. But dodgy behavior aside, the band saw relative success despite changing band members throughout the years with re-recordings by Jayvon Monroe. Darby made 13 albums under the Blood on the Dance Floor name, none of which were studio produced. He collaborated with Jeffree Star on three songs. Darby's album Evolution even featured Joel Madden of Good Charlotte. The majority of Darby's and the band's music actually wasn't released and promoted through a record label, but rather through Darby's own record label, Dark Fantasy Records. And his most successful song, which is still on YouTube for some reason, was the song Bewitched, well over 20 million views. The themes of these albums over time seems to fit the narrative that more and more accusations were being made against Darby. You'll notice the titles of songs and their tone in the early days embody what the scene was and progressively get darker and darker, with strong themes of revenge being introduced later. Darby is infamous for several reasons, and one of them is that he would go through band members and staff, including merch guys and girls, like they were hotcakes. When Garrett Ecstasy was kicked out of the band, the circumstances were not only suspicious, but the timing itself... Well, let me explain. During the OMFG tour 2009 in Colorado, Darby had been arrested on stage whilst performing. Let's be clear, this all is just a rumor that blew out of proportion back in 2009 of September, uh, during the time I was 23. Uh, basically, I, a girl accused me of rape. Um, she took a rape kit, she failed the rape kit, and they proved my, my innocence. Now, if you pull up, uh, if you go and type in, uh, Dobby Vanity Police Report, which I'm going to go ahead and do right now. I'm going to pull it up and we'll go into it. Uh, you'll see it's a, it's a report. It's not a charge. It's not anything. Um, it's just basically saying that I was detained. So during this incident after the show, um, you know, I went down to the police station. And uh, as you look at the, if you look at the police record, you can see that I was facing uh, a sexual assault first degree felony. Um, and it was on September 13th, 2009. Garrett then had to finish the tour on his own, performing the songs along with Darby's parts too, as Darby had been banned from performing the remainder of the tour. So what happened that night? Well, Darby gave Garrett enough reason to quit the band. Garrett had found that the tour bus had been moved to a more secluded area. When opening the door, Garrett said he witnessed two young girls inside and was quickly shooed away by Darby. Let me read the story as reported by Huffington Post as part of a larger piece on Darby and the many accounts of allegations of essay made against him. 
Torres was arrested in 2009, apparently after a woman accused him of SA at one of his shows. In a video on Blood on the Dance Floor's YouTube channel, he later claimed the woman seemed to have underlying mental issues. Police took him into custody, then released him. Witnesses who were present on the night of the alleged incident tell a different story. It was September 12, 2009, and Blood on the Dance Floor was performing in Denver. According to McLaughlin, who was still singing alongside Torres at the time, and a woman named Elise, who did not want to use her full name, who was selling Blood on the Dance Floor merchandise at the show. That night, they said, is what led McLaughlin to quit the band and accuse Torres of P. After setting up the venue, McLaughlin said he and a friend walked out to the parking lot to hang out in Blood on the Dance Floor's tour van until the show started. To their surprise, the van had been moved to a location where it was dark and no one was around. They opened the door and found Torres inside with two girls who appeared to be really young teenagers, he said. Torres chased us away. He didn't want us near the van, said McLaughlin, who said he then went back inside the venue. Time passed and it was getting close to showtime. But according to McLaughlin, Torres was nowhere to be found and the tour van was gone. McLaughlin said he was starting to worry that something was wrong, but Torres showed up just in time and the group went on stage. We play probably two songs and then the lights come on in the building, the sound gets cut off, we're done, they won't let us play. There's somebody up on the sound stage motioning for us to get off stage, said McLaughlin. In my head I'm just wondering what did Darby do? The band stormed through the crowd to figure out what was going on. Police cars had surrounded the building and an officer asked Torres for his name, then handcuffed him against a wall, according to McLaughlin and Elise. Once outside, McLaughlin said he noticed that one of the girls he'd seen in the van was sitting on the ground, speaking to a police officer and pointing at Torres. She sobbed and said Torres had forced her to perform oral S, McLaughlin said. In its story, Metal Sucks published an unverified copy of what appears to be an arrest record from a Colorado police department documenting a SA committed by Torres. It's dated September 13, 2009, the day after Blood on the Dance Floor performed in Denver. Huffington Post was unable to verify the document's legitimacy or confirm if a charge was ever filed. A representative at the Colorado Bureau of Investigations would not say if any arrest records existed in Torres's name and note that sealed court records are not accessible to journalists or the public. This is the alleged arrest record here. And with that, Garrett believed the accusations to be true, making the accusation himself and subsequently leaving the band. How did Darby respond to Garrett leaving and the accusation? A series of unfiltered, what many now believe to be utter slander that I'm not going to read, I'm just going to throw up on the screen for you. You'll notice with many of the survivors of Darby Vanity that his favoured tactic or favoured thing to do was to force oral. Uh, on these young ladies. That was his thing. Garrett was later replaced by Javon Monroe after Darby asked him to join the band on his 18th birthday, a character in this story that we will revisit later. And with his new band member in tow, they re-recorded all the songs with Garrett in them, effectively removing him completely from blood on the dance floor. And now we finally come to the part about Jeffree Star. Jeffrey has his own very controversial history, not just on YouTube, but back in the scene days. His music, if you can call it that, was just as provocative and offensive as Darby's. Now, before you suggest this is a guilt by association thing, realize it's not. Jeffrey has proven himself a liar multiple times, especially when it comes to anything involving Darby vanity. The sheer amount of mental gymnastics this man has done with his interview with Chris Hansen, who really slipped up when he interviewed him about all of this in 2020. Chris did not hold Jeffrey's feet to the fire at all. In fact, most of the interview consisted of Jeffrey Starr just deflecting. But let's start with the infamous screenshots of his tweets calling out Darby for apparent rumours, even though he stated he saw Darby vanity, or rather, we saw him take underage girls to his hotel room but then changed his mind later. He explained this on Hanson Live. There were a string of tweets where you really tore into Dobby Vanity, called him all kinds of things, accused him of what many people are saying about him today, what many of the survivors have said about him. What was behind that? And what was it that you actually said and meant in those tweets? Yeah, so back in the day, there was a lot of crazy rumors about Dobby. Um, there was never any criminal charges against him. He was never put in jail for, I know there was a one instance, um, but he never served real jail time. There was no uh, criminal case against him. So it was this, there was a moment when a lot of us in the music world were not sure 
what was really going on. So it was being in that moment of not knowing, really believing it all because it was very believable. But then at the end of the day, there was no proof. So yes, I tweeted out a lot of things. Did I ever see an actual sexual crime? Absolutely not. Did I see weird, inappropriate behavior? Yes. Um, did I call him a child molester? Yes, because at the time I really believed it. I thought that what people were saying and the, and the weird things that were behind the scenes um, going on, um, that they were all true. And later, did I think that some of it was untrue? Yes. And we're going to dive into that and I'd love to explain why. Um, but I meant those tweets at the time and it was a time where there was a lot of us all on the same page and hyping it all up and saying, hey, this person is really this. So at that moment when I tweeted all those things, yes, I fully believed it. Well, I felt that he was getting a platform that was bigger than I ever thought he would reach, right? Um, and I didn't want my audience to think that if they were true, which he, being the master manipulator that he was, proved to a lot of people at that time that he didn't do anything, that there, that he really wasn't going to jail because he never um, went back to jail after that one incident. So he really tricked us all into thinking, hey, I'm actually not that person, um, which was really scary. And one of the biggest regrets of being dumb enough to believe someone and to getting manipulated into thinking that he's you know an okay person. So everyone wants me to address every single tweet. Let's go. Me calling Dobby my brother, that's just me being dramatic. Dobby was never my brother. We were never best friends. You can think that 100% not the case, but let's talk about me tweeting that he's a monster and then working with him again. So when I was doing um, my last tours, there was a big list, right? Who was gonna play uh, the opening bands before me? Who was gonna play after me? And their name was on the list from their agent. And they were very big at the time. Um, and the allegations, he made them all kind of go away. He manipulated the music scene and he was getting big tours. And I, at the time, was friends with Jay and Brandy, his bandmates. So um, me and Davi hadn't spoken in a while and we he had reached out to me again. And he's like, like begging me to not believe what everyone had said. So I did my own research and I reached out to Jay, of course, Jay. Never seen anything, Jeffrey. Dobby's great. Okay, but that wasn't good enough for me. So I reached out to Brandy. Now, Brandy Wynn was a band member of Blood on the Dance Floor for years and years. Um, she's a mother of four. I said, Brandy, have you ever seen anything illegal for real? Because our agents are trying to put this tour together with them on it, and, I will, and I'm not going to do it. Um, and I would never put him in any light ever again if you have seen something. Because if that's the case, I would rather die than work with him. And she, as a mother, said, Jeffrey, I've seen inappropriate things, but nothing illegal. You know, Dobby is offensive and crass and da 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 da. I took her word for it. Darby's response in 2015, when this was brought up, was somewhat interesting. I want to go into a tweet that Jeffree Star posted about me uh, back in 2009. He quote said that apparently I brought people in my hotel room and I sexually saw people. Now, the night before Jeffrey posted that tweet, I went on stage and I said some stupid shit about Jeffrey. He was really upset about that. Of course, everyone knows when you piss off Jeffree Star or any you know, shit with Jeffrey, he gets pretty vile. He gets pretty angry and he'll tweet some fucked up shit and he'll try to get his fan base rallied up and, and, to, and to go and attack people. Of course, you know, in 2011, he went on my tour bus and Warped Tour. He apologized for his actions. I forgave him. Um, you know, he's actually defended me on Twitter. We baked cookies. Uh, we did a song called Poison Apple back in 2013. So clearly we're cool. And I, you know, people don't see that aspect of it. But, you know, when people are angry at each other, we tweet some pretty fucked up shit to each other. And, um, you know, does, did he mean that? No, he didn't mean that. He, like I said, he apologized to me about it. So there, there's that. Also, as a weird side note, Jeffrey, for some reason, decided to lie about him headlining the 2012 The Scene Is Dead tour, when in fact he was the opener and Blood on the Dance Floor were the headliners bit odd to lie about that. Another thing I find strange about Jeffree Star is his interview on Keemstar's podcast, Mum's Basement, as clipped and shown by Tay Mimi. We saw Darby bring underage girls to his hotel rooms and do things 100% illegal. Of course, people are going to interpret that as you seeing that with your own eyes. Oh, of course. So 10 years so ten years later, I'm telling people, did I see a crime or anything actual illegal? No. Other people did and told me that at the time. And then it was not proven. Four children themselves, a grown mother, as his band members say, Jeffrey, I've been in his world for years and I've, I've lived on the tour bus and I've never seen anything. So that's why I did the last tour. Um, did I ever actually see anything? No. So my tweets were other people saying that. You know, maybe I'm saying it wrong. He's using the first person plural, like we. Yeah, we yeah, saw yeah. That's yeah, the main because thing at that time, there were things to about situations like this. Go ahead. But because when I said we, there was people, um, my old uh, dancer and assistant, Daniel, um, he tweeted out a bunch of stuff and other bands on the tour um, and people in the music scene, like, li like literally like all the people like Taking Back Sunday and those Warped Tour bands, they all thought he was really creepy. And there was just a bunch of he said, she said, and there was never any actual real proof back then. He's also lied about not being a drinker or doing anything harder. 
He claims that he has taken tons of photos pretending to drink, but claims that in reality he has never drank before. I can tell you, from somebody who actually doesn't drink, this is the dumbest thing to lie about. He was either going completely out of his way to lie about drinking back in the day, or he is lying about not drinking now. Either way, he lied. And while this isn't as serious as the other contradictions in this video, it points out a pattern that reflects his credibility. So I leave it to you, viewer, to decide if anything Jeffrey has said in regards to vanity is actually truthful. Anyway, back to the band. Let's talk about Javon Monroe, real name Jeremy Griffiths. He had been a fan of Blood on the Dance Floor for two years prior to him being recruited by Darvi. Darvi asked him to join on his 18th birthday and immediately took a weird pseudo parenting role over Javon. Jay was young and very impressionable and it has been said by many survivors of Darby and those who knew him that he is a very charismatic and incredibly good at bringing you over to his side on things. Darby took control of pretty much everything in Jay's life. His money, paid his bills, his car insurance, manipulated him and even went as far as withholding Jay's HIV medication. But Jay gave a statement to SputnikMusic.com that I'm going to read. With respect and all honesty, I feel that it is only the right of any fan out there to know why I left Blood on the Dance Floor a few months ago. As an artist who has changed not only how they look physically, but how they think, write and create, I began to feel constricted and creatively limited by the other half of the group. It started around 2014 after we had made some progression of having a real message for the young people who made up 80% of the fan base. The music sales started to go down because streaming had become the new way of listening to music instead of iTunes downloads. He panicked and insisted in writing material that was based around the older concept of the group, unnecessarily offensive and overly s. When your fan base is made of teens, these are usually subjects you'd want to avoid. When I joined at 18, I didn't feel that inappropriate about it until I became older and felt like a pervert singing these songs to kids. I went a few years touring and working for the band, but Darby insisted on not paying me. Instead, he wanted to be somewhat of a caretaker and played that role from the beginning. I allowed it because I was young and overwhelmed by the glory of being 18 and touring the nation to meet people that enjoyed the same things I did. I was too timid and with Darby's short temper that he had displayed on many occasions by firing his employees with absolute no reason, I feared that I would be next. I didn't want to push his buttons and be left with nothing. He paid my phone bill, paid my car insurance, my half of the rent as well as my medical insurance. Instead of just paying me how an employee should be, but I had enough of this weird quote-unquote daddy relationship. My mother would always ask why I never had any money or why I couldn't afford to go see her in my hometown in Florida. It ruined relationships for me, not just with boyfriends, but people that worked for him and other bands we toured with. I was manipulated to dislike anyone who tried to call him out. At some point, a few years into the band's career, I had a long talk with him about maybe just paying me so he didn't have to take care of me all the time. He gave in and put me on retainer that was mostly late or incomplete to our agreement. Instead, he kept me under his thumb so as to make sure I couldn't leave or was codependent on our relationship. When the band had a manager, he became responsible for paying me, and it lasted for almost a year until the manager was fired. There were times when I literally had nothing, yet Darby was spending lavishly on ridiculous novelties, custom-made clothing, and flying random girls in to stay slash live with us. I finally started to work independently after getting permission from Darby in late 2014, and that's how I stayed alive. About a year ago, I had gotten very sick for a while, and then shortly after was diagnosed HIV positive, and I needed to get medication and medical help started. Yet there was a tour that was booked for the band. As I saw it, there won't be a tour if I'm physically not up to it, but Darby saw it differently. He just kept pushing it in my face that we couldn't afford to cancel the tour, and that any medical help that I need would just have to wait until we come back for my treatment. He couldn't afford a tour because the extreme $60,000 debt Darby had put himself in, despite having just bought himself a new car, so I reluctantly agreed against my better judgment to go out on tour and was dragged all through the country sick as a dog and waited it out. The tour ended up being a total bust, the attendance was lower than ever before, the fans were being charged an arm and a leg for a VIP meet and the greet that either was late and rushed because Darby was in the hotel with the girl, or was cancelled completely because the shows weren't happening. 
Dates were cancelled left and right by promoters and venue owners that had heard about Darby's reputation. When we finally got home, I immediately got treatment and after a few months had passed and a new health routine. I was back to myself. I am now undetectable and healthy according to my doctors. I am very lucky and especially thankful to everyone who had been there with me along the way. In October, we released Scissors, the last album we did together. I wrote every song on the deluxe version with the exception of two. Darby paid me $1,000 to write all of the material in less than two weeks period. It was just too much work for too little money and after what happened with the last tour and just a general feeling of being taken advantage of by Darby for a long time, I left the band. I needed a new life, I couldn't live in that situation anymore, yet I had nowhere to go and he knew that, so he took advantage of what he could until I couldn't take it any longer, so I left. Darby ended up abruptly moving to Ohio to be with his then girlfriend and I was left essentially homeless. So I ended up moving back to Arizona with my friend and I'm living a quiet desert farm life in Tucson while I rebuild my life and start a new career. Recently, Darby opted to continue to tour as Blood on the Dance Floor, still selling merch with my name and face on it, signing my name onto posters I've never seen or touched, and obviously still playing music I wrote for him. On top of not being paid by any of these merch sales using my likeness, he's now saying that he's out on stage performing in my honour, obviously trying to capitalise on my illness, as he has referred to it to fans. I feel his statements about me were insensitive and unnecessary. I have been through hell and back and still fighting, and I feel like I'm being mocked by him as some kind of cruel joke. I've always told fans to not be afraid to speak your mind and embrace your true self, so I'm taking my own advice. My piece is now said, I'm closing the book on it. I still love music and will continue to create. I love all the people who stood by me all these years and who will still continue to stand with me during these times of new growth. You're all the reason I exist, thank you all. It is at this point I would like to remind you of something and tell you another thing that you might not know. Firstly, both Jay and Jeffree Star remained friends or friendly with Darby, and in Jay's case went as far as taking part in the Jesse Slaughter drama. Jay also took part in the parody video making fun of Jesse and her dad. He is a victim, but he also willingly took part in some more public controversial actions. Jeffree Star also would have known about Jesse Slaughter too. In fact, he also tried to suggest that he wasn't aware of her on that podcast, but as Tay Mimi shows in her video, he tweet replied making fun of her using the infamous tagline, you done goofed. No, there, there is a survivor that um, has went on record saying, hey, Jeffrey and his friends were present during me being there in these times. Um, and 10 years ago, I don't remember that person. And I'm not gonna pretend to, to follow a narrative of, of what people want me to say that I saw. Meanwhile, there are tweets of him making fun of Damien with the you done goofed me. But back to the band. Darby was infamous for not paying members of his crew, but Jay would leave the band in autumn 2016 and was temporarily replaced by Darby's girlfriend, Fallon Vendetta. Now, Fallon has spoken on Chris Hansen and on Belle Aubrey's channel about her experience with Darby. In the beginning, she claimed to not really know Darby or Blood on the Dance Floor and met him the usual way, through Instagram, in DMs and later phone calls. The relationship didn't last as Davy kept cheating on her and she mentioned in her interview with Belle Aubrey that he just wouldn't really commit to her properly. Like many before her, when she finally got wind about the now mountain of allegations, she believed Darby because, again, charismatic and very manipulative. She remained a part of the band until the very end of 2018 slash beginning of 2019, and now Darby was all alone. Now, from here on, Darby's music is pretty much completely irrelevant. He's tried to rebrand several times since 2019. Kawaii Monster and The Most Vivid Nightmares. I believe he now has an FBI investigation ongoing into him. Admittedly, I did skip over a lot here, only choosing to focus in on these major milestones just to give a history of the band and outline some of the more serious stuff, and just point out Jay's and Jeffree Star's behaviours. Some of the next section will overlap with this and the previous. I want to go through the allegations, but from the mouths of those survivors. I'm not going to show them in full, obviously, but they will be linked in full down below. I just want to focus in on overlapping behaviours of Darby and also go through the other accusations made by former employees of the bands or other bands that have their own experiences with Darby. So let's move on. 
And now we move on to the section of the video where I'm simply just going to take some clips from interviews with some of the survivors from the Repzilla channel, Belle Aubrey and Chris Hansen, and just play them. You may find these difficult to listen to, but I believe it to be important to just take a few clips and let them speak. I will overlay some text just to help you identify who is who. And how old were you at this time? I was 15 at the time. I might have started talking to him when I was 14, but I don't remember, but I know that I was 15 when I met him. And so you connect in Orlando and how did that first meeting go? Oh, well, I got out of the car and he immediately started air humping me against my friend's car and was like, oh, thank you so much for bringing her to me. And I'm like, mm, great. So this was like a gift of some sort? He immediately started <laughs> air humping you? Yeah, the... it was very uncomfortable. I should say. And you were 15 at the time? Yes, I was 15. And this would have been what, 2000 and... 2008, I think, I want to say. The, like my next memory from that day goes straight to the last part of the night. I and what, what and when you say last part of the night, did you, were you partying with him? Were you just hanging out? He was just playing the music. What was going on? I mean, I, I'm assuming we were just hanging out probably just like listening to music or something, talking probably. But uh, he's like, oh, you want to drink? And back then I used to drink a lot when I was a kid. I used to drink a, a lot. And I was like, yeah, you got any whiskey? So he gets me like a Jack and Coke or something. And uh, I only had one drink. In fact, I remember I can see the glass visually. I could see it in my head. Like I know what the glass looks like. Right. I, I didn't even have the whole drink. I think I may have had half of it. Do you think the drink was spiked? Honestly, it's there's a good chance because my only memory from that night, aside from the initial uh, that I just described, which is more vivid, the only memory I have from the part from him giving me a drink is literally that, and then like a snippet of what happened next, and then waking up. And what happened next? Well, um, I don't know. Like it was kind of all of a sudden, but he like grabbed the back of my head and like got on his he like had like a pallet laid out on a little like living room floor or something and he grabbed the back of my head and like forcefully like aggressively like shoved it down on his crotch like he got on his knees and put and like adjusted my body to be on my knees how he was basically using his friend and the people he knew to introduce like one on the dance floor to young kid that's that's what happened to me i was given a cd and then told to add it on my space mm -hmm. And then he told me to do the same thing, but like he, he drugged me, he, he's been very violent with me. So it's, he has a, a large set of behaviors and I, I, I saw a lot of things and it's a lot to process. When I was like in it, I thought, oh, I'm so cool. I'm so grown. I'm hanging out with these older kids, uh, older kids, they're in their 20s. Oh, yeah, they're not kids. <laughs> you know, we were yeah. teens, 20s. I think maybe the oldest guy was like 40. That was weird. Nobody said anything <sighs> about it. <laughs> <sighs> And it's, it's just, when I was in it, I didn't really think about it. And then afterward, I, it like took a very long time for me to actually come to the fact that like, I am not a normal teenager, not necessarily because I'm special, but because like, I, I was, I was fucked up. I was used. It just, it fucks with my brain and it's continued to fuck with my brain. Just haven't been basically the entertainment for them. And I don't know. And then being dumped off so easily, it just, it, it like, It's mind blowing. I don't know how I've dealt with it. I, I developed maladaptive daydreaming disorder. I lied a shit ton and destroyed all credibility that I had on the internet. Mm -hmm. Thanks, 14 year old Damien. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that Jeffree Star called out Dobby Vandy because of me in August of 2010, literally a month after the whole You Don't Do thing happened, mm -hmm. and then made up with him. Only after, I don't know, maybe some financial shit. Like, it just, it seems like Jeffree Star only has a financial incentive for anything he does. Like, mm -hmm. it seemed like he was trying to defend me at one point, but then, like, because the favor wasn't in my direction, he, like, backed the fuck off because, like, there wasn't any money in it. Mm -hmm. And then he just goes to, to, to basically be like, oh, my brother Davi, when, like, you, he saw me. Like, you, you said you saw me. Mm -hmm. And he seemed really nice, and he was instantly charming. He grabbed my hand and kissed it, and he bowed to me like he was some sort of knight. I was 16 at the time. I believe I was 16. And my friend was 18. And um, he like talked to my parents, made sure we were good. So then my parents left. Um, we were in this little tiny room the whole time. Um, we could see Dobby kind of, you know, in the studio doing the, the, the video. And there was this one part where like, he was randomly coming up to the window shirtless and like being silly. Like he was like, oh, you know, kind of doing weird things with us, we we're laughing. And then um, after the video, you know, skip past the end, we were taking pictures and I felt his hand go on my butt. And I, I thought it was an accident at first, you know, and um, 
when I was on the ride home with my friend, I texted it to her. I was like, hey, this kind of happened. And she texted back. She was like, me too. And we kind of just laughed it off and giggled. And um, so I, I kind of shook that off. I was like, whatever. But honestly, I was really taken by him. His charisma was intoxicating. And I, I knew that I wanted to be in his life for as long as possible. I wanted to be his friend. I wanted to be, I wanted to be there for him. And he's like, I want to talk to you in the bathroom. I want to do your hair. Like, and I was like, okay. And my friend wanted to come with and he kind of closed the door. He's like, no, I, I just want to talk to her. So he closed the door and he turned on the shower so no one could hear. And he was like, you've been here since day one. I really appreciate you. I want to know, I want you to know that like, I love you. And he came over to give me a hug. And like, I was really awkward back then. And I reached for a hug and I accidentally, I know this is really kind of graphic, but I accidentally rubbed up against his crotch and it was like really hard. And I was like, oh my God, this is awkward. And his heart was beating really fast. And he gave me a hug and we were just kind of like rocking back and forth. And he was like, how old are you again? And I was like 17. And he started rubbing my back and he's like, so close, so, so close. And I was like, awkward. And so I, I backed off and there was this little bottle of Sunny D on the, the table, the counter. Sorry, I'm awkward at this. No. And I was trying to like diffuse the situation. I'm like, can I have some of your Sunny D? And then he's like, oh, you want to Sunny my D? I'll let you Sunny my D. And he like came, came up close to me and I grabbed the bottle and I was going to put some in my mouth and he grabbed it and he's like, you want me to put that in your mouth for you? And I was like, no, thanks. I can handle it myself. And I put it in my mouth, but I spilled it like all over myself because I was nervous. And um, I was wearing a white shirt. So like, he's like, oh, let me clean that for you. And he like started rubbing my chest and he's like, your boobs are so big. Can I touch them? And I backed off and I was like, uh, no, I had a boyfriend at the time. Cause like in my head, like at that moment, I was kind of in shock. I wasn't, it was awkward, but I was also excited like for the attention. I, I know it's weird to say like, oh my God, he's interested in me in my head. But I was like, I have a boyfriend. I can't. I was like, oh, you're always playing with your hair. And he's like, yeah, I, I care about my appearance. And then I was like, you're a dork. And he's like, you're a dork. And he pushed me up against the door. And um, he's like, before I leave, uh, can I try something? And I was like, what? And he's like, open your mouth. And he stuck his finger down my throat. And I was like, I had no idea what that meant back then. You know, I was really innocent. I had, I did not know. And so when we got out, um, there was two beds in this hotel room. So I was in on one of the beds and he was on the other across and under the blanket, he was like touching himself mm -hmm. and he winked at me and I was like, oh God. And I looked down and I was like really flustered and um, after that, we were just talking to the rest of the people in the room. And when we were leaving, I went to give him a hug and he whispered in my ear, don't have sex. And I was like, uh, don't worry about it. And he tried to kiss me on, on the lips and I dodged him and I kissed his cheek and just left. And so that was like the first experience. Did you think that was odd that he would offer to come get a 16 year old girl and bring you to his concert? I thought it was, I mean, I can't, I can't lie at that time. I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, like he wants to like come get me himself. Um, I didn't see anything wrong with that, but it got weird when he called me because he didn't want to speak to my mom. Um, he wanted me to actually, I was like really like, oh mom, he's on the phone, like he wants to talk to you. And she, he's like, no, 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 don't, don't give the phone to your mom. I need you to like go in your room, lock the door. Um, and I need you to like, you know, talk to me alone. And that's when everything got weird after that because in order to get those tickets, he, he was saying, if I wanted them so bad, I would have to give him what he called an oral report. An oral report. And did you even understand what he was getting at? at no. That age? Did you have any clue what he, what he meant? No, I didn't know about sex at all, really, at 16. My mom was a young mom. She kind of kept that, you know, quiet. She took me kind of out of sex ed. Like, I was just kind of, what do you mean? Like, you want me to tell you why? Like, you want me to give you, like, a reason why I want these tickets? And he said, oh, you know what I mean? Like, a, you know, oral sex. And that's when I it clicked and I was like, oh, no, no, no. I'm only 16. Like, I've never done anything like that before. And he couldn't really take no as an answer, but he was very good at convincing you. Like, it's, it's, it's awesome, it's amazing. It's something like, you know, you've never experienced it before. Can you believe you get to experience it with me? Like someone you look up to. And he would say like comments like, oh, you'll love it. Um, it tastes like ice cream. And uh, I was just kind of, he could tell that in my voice, I was like, uh, no. Uh, so he would switch the subject. And then that's when we got the conversation about schoolgirl fantasies, which ended up being like the theme of our whole entire relationship. And uh, what did he have you do? in terms of this fantasy with schoolgirl relationships? Well, ever since I've known him, anytime we met up, he wanted me to dress up like a schoolgirl. And he actually convinced me to be a schoolgirl for Halloween at 16. And I took photos in it. He, he was really interested in my chest and he wanted to see kind of sexy pictures of me, which I sent him. I didn't know better. I just, you know, this was new to me. This is the first guy I ever did anything like this with. And all, all of which is illegal for him to entice you underage to send mm -hmm. what certainly is construed to be pornographic pictures. Is he a predator? Is he a criminal? Is he an opportunist? Is he all of the above? How would you best describe him based upon the time? I mean, he knows he's a predator. He's told me that he's attracted to younger girls. Uh, he's, there's been times, I mean, he trusted me so much because we had known each other for so long. At his most vulnerable moments, like if he was drunk or if he, he would cry about it, he was, I'm sick, I don't know why I'm like this. Um, 
I, you know, even when we were dating last year, um, you know, I, we had issues with, with him Snapchatting young girls. And he would show me pictures of girls that were Snapchatting him and uh, they were underage. And he's like, I know, I know, I just, you know, I, they, you know, they want to, it's, it's fine. And I always like, I just kind of like didn't know how to approach him with that. This is one of those situations where I make one of these kinds of videos, the retrospective style, docu-style videos, where I don't really need to do much. I just need to let people speak and you guys decide from there. If you would like to listen to those interviews in full, you will find them linked either in the description or the pinned comment alongside various other sources used for the research of this video. So now that you've heard mostly accusations and allegations against Darby, whether it was physical, financial, psychological, or any other types of abuse, we should also hear what he had to say in his defense. I'm just going to go ahead and play his defense videos, although clipped. Again, the link is down below so you can view all of this in its full context. Hello, my name is Jesus David Torres. I am the lead singer of Blood on the Dance Floor. I'm here to address the accusations that are made against me. Of course, I am not here to make accusations about anybody else. This is just to add clarity to all the accusations and bullshit people have made of me. So the awful rumors began back in 2009. I played a show, and after the show, I had relations with a woman. And after I had relations with a woman, she seemed to have underlying mental issues. Next thing you know, I'm being arrested by police. I go down to the police station. I, I tell my side of the story. She takes a rape kit. She fails a rape kit. They prove my innocence. I was never charged with a crime. You can look up my name on public records, Jesus David Torres. Um, you can see I was never charged as a sex offender or any of that stuff, but yet people threw in their accusations and they made their rumors and blogs and next thing you know, I'm public enemy number one. So after all this drama went down, of course, hey, let's jump on the bandwagon, let's make accusations against Blood on Dance Floor. In the case of the girl that with the Udungu video. Obviously, this was a teenager with mental issues who posted online. So at that point, we're just like, what the hell's going on? Like, there was never any legal accusations. There was never any court dates. There was nothing. You you can't find any records of it because it never happened, folks. Uh, no matter what people blogged about or whatnot, it was clearly nonsense. So I might want to add a reminder to everyone that there is a parental warning advisory when you purchase the album. So there is a warning. This music is not intended for children. It is for audience that are mature, that are 18 and older. Now, if somebody younger listens to it, that's not our fault. That's their choice to listen to it. And it's not that we purposely or secretly try to gear our music towards a younger audience. We actually gear our music for an older audience. So that doesn't really make any sense. The point is, is that just because I write a song called Yoho and it's about a pirate, doesn't make me a real life fucking pirate. If you do see somebody defaming me, Please do not respond with hatred, respond with wisdom. That's the message to all of this. I hope that I've enlightened people and that I've guided people in the right direction. Take care, thank you for your time, peace. You are entitled to your opinion. You're entitled to inform your opinion, but you're not entitled to be ignorant. Uh, there's been an incident where I asked for bras on stage. Now, this was during a show and I basically said, hey, throw your bras on stage or whatever. Um, you know, at the time, I was really influenced by bands like All Time Low and Blink-182, who do this in all their shows. If you ever go to a Blink-182 show or if you go to an All Time Low show, um, I actually we toured Warped Tour with All Time Low. So, of course, you know, I was drunk. I was high one night. I'm saying some stupid shit on stage. I admit my wrong. I, I did it. I asked for bras on stage. Am I... Was that the best thing for me to do? No, that was a very shitty thing for me to do. It was terrible. Um, and I'm still suffering from that. Let me let me make this clear to everybody. When I was asking for those bras on stage, I was asking that for mature women, older women. I wasn't asking it from teenagers or any of that crazy shit. A thing I saw on the, the Truth About Dabby Vanity blog on Tumblr where someone was saying I was sending a nude photo to an underage girl. Let's make this loud and clear. The photo I sent of me covering up my private parts was a girl named Tiffany Davis. The girl at the time was 18. 
it was just her 18th birthday. Yeah, that's pretty close. Um, she, she went from 17 to 18. I sent her that, that image. It wasn't my dick. It was just me covering up my private parts. It was just a provocative picture. However, you know what? She was 18, and people don't even know that. Now, do I make music for kids or teenagers? No. You know, I never never ask for kids to, to come to my show or do that. Uh, clearly, there's a parental advisory warning on my CDs, and I gear my music towards 18-year-olds and up. You know, do I, do I control what people listen to or how old they are? No, I don't. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, like when I play sexing, I have to, I can't look at people in the face or look at them in the eye if they're younger, cause it's just weird. Um, you know, do I gear my music towards a younger audience? No, I don't. And I can't help who listens to my music or who comes to our shows. No one's ever complained about us on these shows that it's ever been a dangerous environment or anything like that. Everyone feels safe and we love seeing parents come to the show. We hang out with our parents. In fact, I have some drinks with the parents at the bar and we, you know, kick shit and just talk. But, you know, um, you know, I even check IDs. I literally, any person I hang out with after a show, I check their ID. If they're not 18 and up, um, you know, if they're 18, I hang out with them. If they're younger than 18, I'm like, bye Felicia. Not attracted to younger women, apparently. No crimes because no record. Addresses Jeffree Star trying to dismiss claims of being a p-word by suggesting people were using fear and ignorance and also using jay as a shield because he's gay dismissing the content of his songs despite the lyrics and his all age shows saying no one's ever complained which is demonstrably false suggesting that he ids people doesn't even acknowledge diana farrell jesse slaughter or other allegations suggests the survivor of 2009 Colorado had mental issues, inadvertently mentioned Jesse Slaughter's apology video without actually saying her name, dismisses rumors because other people tour with them, says he's a gentleman and has treated women right, again demonstrably false, encourages fans to respond more positively yet forgets he doxed Jesse Slaughter's number and told fans to call and tell her what they thought of her, preaches BS positivity and ends the video by telling you that you are entitled to your opinion yet not entitled to be ignorant. After everything you've seen in this video, whether you've watched all of this video and watched other creators outlining Darby Vanity's career or whether you haven't, I leave you to decide. Although I haven't shown absolutely everything because there are even more allegations, examples of dodgy behavior and more, ultimately it is up to you to make up your own minds about Darby. I'm just here to tell a story, but I have one more section of this video before we can part ways. So let's move on. So Darvi in the current year as of 2021 is primarily on Instagram. He did have an OnlyFans but that was taken down. He was also removed from Spotify too. It is believed that other than promoting and selling his merch designs to what remains of his fan base, it is thought that he is still up to his old grooming like behavior, which at this point wouldn't surprise me in the least. Before I close out this video, I just want to throw in a few honorable mentions that I thought were worth bringing up. Darvi had a documentary made about blood on the dance floor. It's a self-made documentary about an hour long where Darvi spends most of it hyping himself up, just really tongue punching his own turtle cave. I've watched it, it's one of the worst documentaries I have ever seen. He really tries to portray himself as this suffering artist type who's simply amazing. It is not a documentary, it is an abomination. This is what he looked like as a kid. Ha. This is what he looks like without a wig, ha! <laughs> well anyway, I once again ask you the question, why did people stop talking about him? Was it a downturn in views? Did creators just struggle too much getting the videos monetized and therefore into the algorithm? Did they just get bored? I mean, there are entire dedicated Twitter accounts that were made for exposing Darby. Did all the survivors say their piece and move on with no justice? I'm fairly sure the FBI are currently investigating Darby, but I just find it odd. I mean, creators never stopped harping on about Onision, did they? Maybe creators just had nothing more to add. Maybe people like Jeffree Star saying that drama channels were profiting off of this on Chris Hansen's live stream, whilst he was literally profiting off of this. Oh, I forget, it, it, it's different when it's Chris Hansen, despite him, you know, actually doing nothing other than platforming the survivors whilst making tons of money. 
In my personal opinion, I think the issue as to why Darby isn't behind bars currently and why people stop talking about him, well, there's a list. It's a bit nuanced. One, several parents and survivors opted to not press charges. Two, state to state, cross state jurisdiction issues. Three, Darby silencing survivors. Four, corrupting R kits by telling survivors to rinse their mouth out afterwards. Five, the evidence, unfortunately, most, if not almost all the evidence that could actually do anything in a court of law is testimonies. Testimonies from survivors and former bandmates and employees and former friends. That and screenshots. I'm no expert in law, but I'm fairly sure those things aren't enough. And it's not as if I don't believe them, because I honestly do. But it is a very complicated situation that I truly hope justice is brought to Darvi and he serves a long time for the things he's done. But maybe I'm wrong on this, guys. The reason why creators stop talking about him and the reasons why he's not behind bars, please, by all means, your opinions are most welcome. But I'm done talking about this dude. If you got this far into the video, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much to my mod who assisted in not only researching this topic, but fact checking and just glossing over the content as it was made. You know who you are. Thank you to all those creators and survivors for even talking about this in the first place. Links to every creator whose content I use for this video down below. Go subscribe. And thank you once again to all of you. Have a great day. Look after yourselves. Peace.